of the Department of History and Political Science here at Norwich University, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our last panel of the day, but not the last panel of the 2022 Peace and War Summit. I'll just announce right up the front, as you right off the bat, as you all know, uh, that tomorrow morning we will have two more panels specifically dealing with Russian internal domestic politics at 9.25 a.m. in Mac Auditorium and uh, a panel on U.S. policy towards Russia at 10.50 in Mac Auditorium right here. So as we wrap up the first day, um, I think we're off to a great start. I wanted to extend my thanks to all of the wonderful people involved in this summit who've helped to make it, I think, a great success. Each panel, starting with the keynotes this morning, has been very well attended. So I certainly want to extend my thanks to Professor Yang Moku for just doing all of the hard work to put something like this together, Professor Travis Morris, uh, Megan Liptak, thank you for all the hard work you've done to make this happen. I also wanted to extend my thanks to all the panelists and visitors to campus today for coming here, devoting your time to share with our students and with the public some vital information that is certainly directly relevant to the state of affairs the world finds itself in. Um, and my last but certainly not least, I want to thank the Norwich faculty, staff, and students who have participated and uh, attended all of the events both today and hopefully tomorrow. Uh, this, is, this is all for you and we're glad that you could be here and help make this a success. As I turn now, I turn to introducing the panel that is before you. This panel is actually a bit different from some of the other panels you've seen today in that this is made up of, as was referenced this morning, some of the most important people in the room, which is the future leaders, military and civilian and political, who are going to have to be wrestling with the decisions that are being made as we speak. This is the student panel. Last fall, as the Peace and War Summit was being planned, we sent out an invitation not just to Norwich students, but to students at various other universities in the region, inviting them to submit proposals not necessarily on the Russian issue, but on any issues related to history, political science, international affairs, basically anything within the scope of the Journal of Peace and War Studies. We received a fascinating variety of papers and members of the editorial board of the Peace and War Center, of the Peace and War, excuse me, Journal of Peace and War Studies, uh, reviewed those papers and selected three that we think are a very interesting and certainly timely window into some important subjects. Once again, these are not necessarily directly relevant to the topic of the summit, which is Russia and the Russian question and Russia and Ukraine. But I think you're going to find the topics addressed in these student papers today do have relevance, do have relevance, not just maybe not necessarily for the strategy and the political questions involving Russia, but certainly questions that the world is facing and perhaps specifically the United States is facing at the dawn of the 21st century. So as we move forward, my goal here for the, our panel is we have three student presenters. They will each be given 15 minutes to give a, present, a summation of the papers that they submitted for this panel. At the end, I will invite our two discussants, Professor Mary Kim and Professor Michael Funberg, to offer about five minutes each some discussion, some comments on the student papers, maybe ask them some questions. I'll then give maybe five to 10 minutes for the students to respond to some of those comments if they wish. Uh, and after that, I really hope, think we'll have a good 10, 15 minutes to open up for Q&A from the audience. I think these are, as once again, as up-and-coming scholars, these are students who can certainly uh, use some guidance moving forward and get some feedback on their work. So I will introduce the panel from my left to the end, beginning with our first student panelist, Ethan Owens. Ethan is a Norwich University fourth-year cadet and a member of the Norwich Army ROTC. He is a double major in history and political science and will commission as a second lieutenant in the United States Army upon his graduation in May. Uh, branched armor, I correct? Yes. To his left is, uh, our, is Caleb Riley, who comes to us today from the University of Vermont, where he is pursuing a Master of Arts in History. Caleb is a Special Forces Captain who graduated with a BS in American History from the United States Military Academy and commissioned as an infantry officer in 2011. 
His academic interests include the history of Allied special operations during World War II and 20th century American foreign policy. He has publications in, such as an article in Special Warfare detailing his experiences as a Special Forces Detachment Commander and a publication in History Review comparing the Circassian and Armenian genocides. And finally, John Walsh is another Norwich University student, a sophomore majoring in criminal justice who's looking to add a Spanish minor to his studies. He is Navy ROTC. He's a Navy ROTC, ROTC midshipman who is contracted with the United States Marine Corps. His presentation at this conference reflects his diverse interests in world cultures, literature, art, politics, and violence. Our two discussants today are both my colleagues in the Department of History and Political Science, representing both history and political science respectively. Associate Professor of History Miri Kim has been at Norwich since 2014. She is, currently serves as the Director of pardon me, Program Coordinator for the Studies in War and Peace degree program in our department. She has a BA in History from Reed College and a Doctorate in History from the University of California, Irvine. Her research focuses on the military and institutional history of Northeast China during the Republican period. And her coursework here at Norwich offers a variety of courses relating particularly to world history, East Asian history, and certainly courses on both modern China and modern Japan. She's also the faculty advisor for our Mal UN chapter here on campus and recently led that group to the annual National Harvard Model UN Conference down in Massachusetts. Finally, Assistant Professor of Political Science Michael Funberg has been on the Norwich faculty since 2017. He has a BS in Political Science from Northern Illinois University and both an MA and Doctorate in Political Science from West Virginia. His research focuses primarily on the American presidency, particularly how the president shapes policy through executive orders. He teaches a variety of courses on the American political system and issues in public policy, and he's also recently returned from a trip, having taken the annual DC Policy Week group down to Washington, DC, where a group, about a dozen group, a group of about a dozen Norwich students headed down to DC over spring break and attended meetings and visits with various agencies involved in the American National Security Establishment. Professor Thunberg is also the current director of the Norwich University Honors Program. Before we begin, please join me in giving a round of applause for our panelists. Once again, we have three student panelists for you today. I'm going to, having introduced them all, I'm going to invite them to come up in sequence and just address you directly. And then at the end, we'll turn to the comments from our discussants. First up is Ethan Owens with Evaluating the Value of U.S. Diplomacy Through Strategic Ambiguity. Ethan. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Ethan Owens, and like you said, I'll be going over uh, the evaluating the value of U.S. diplomacy through strategic ambiguity. So my agenda for today, the things I'm going to go over. First is my research question about what this paper was all about, uh, my introduction to ambiguity, what that means in the scope of my project, uh, the two pieces of literature that were crucial to strengthening my argument, which is Wilsonian open door internationalism and deterrence arms race. Then I'll go over my main argument, which I call tension and ambiguity argument. And then the three focal points of my discussion, which are these three time periods and how the tension plays into that. I'll explain that a little bit more later. And then the policy implications that w could potentially come out of this project and we'll conclude there. So my research question is, why has the US policy of strategic ambiguity been utilized to balance Taiwan-China relations since 1979? And what, to what extent is it still a viable option? So essentially what I'm looking at is strategic ambiguity and using ambiguous language in U.S. policy and seeing how that balances the tension between uh, China and Taiwan and how the United States can play a role in that through uh, strategic ambiguity and through that scope whether strategic ambiguity is still a viable option to use today. So my introduction to ambiguity. Uh, this first part right here is the uh, definition that I gave strategic ambiguity in my paper. Um, so when discussing strategic ambiguity, I'm talking about any policy created by the United States towards China and Taiwan that is purposefully ambiguous and its true intention of support or opposition to either Chinese or Taiwanese agenda. So essentially, I can break that into three main aspects, right? You've got the purpose towards China. So if the United States creates ambiguous language in its policy that doesn't necessarily side with China or Taiwan directly, China doesn't know if the United States would support or deny an invasion of Taiwan. So China's fearful that the United States could side with Taiwan 
in a devastating war between the two. So it keeps China on its toes to not invade. Conversely, uh, ambiguous language proves to Taiwan that if Taiwan is to declare independence, that would also start a war, and the United States would potentially not support Taiwan, and Taiwan would be crushed by the Chinese. So both sides are split in this balancing act of being fearful and paranoid about whether or not the United States is going to support them or not, and that's a, uh, essentially strategic ambiguity in a nutshell. So the policy that's utilized that, that has this ambiguous language in U.S. policy, uh, there are three main communiques that were done, uh, Shanghai communique, normalization communique and the communique on United States arms sale to Taiwan. The most important of these, however, in my personal opinion, is the Taiwan Relations Act of 1979. This set the whole framework of how the United States is going to handle Taiwan going forward. So some examples of ambiguous language. These are all taken from the communiques and the Taiwan Relations Act. You can see how they kind of tactically dance around the fact about whether we're going to call Taiwan independent state or not. For example, you, you notice that they, they call it a peaceful settlement of the Taiwan question by the Chinese themselves. So because Taiwan is ethnically and culturally Chinese, they, the United States kind of adopts a, a sort of one, chi uh, one China policy where they call the Taiwanese Chinese, but they also, as you can see, um, the United States recognizes the PRC as the sole China, but the United States supports Taiwan with unofficial relations, which is largely arms sales, and I'll get into that in a little bit. So th these are some examples of that, that weird, ambiguous language that they use that keeps people from recognizing which side the United States supports. So I'll get into the literature real quick. Uh, Wilsonian Open Door Internationalism. This was spearheaded by Dr. Uh, Dean Chen uh, in this book here. Um, the, the biggest piece of takeaway that I got from this is uh, in President Woodrow Wilson's presidency in the 1950s, uh, he was a very idealistic president. And one of the things that he pushed was the concept of democratic peace theory, which is essentially that uh, democratic nations will not go to war with one another because they share similar values. Um, so because of this, the United States kind of started to grow this sense of we need to spread democracy and we need to make the world a democratic and thus peaceful place. Um, and this kind of planted the seeds of this uh, very emotional and passionate driven policy making from the United States that we need to preserve and spread democracy. Uh, this plays a huge role in dealing with Taiwan because there were numerous instances in the 60s and 70s where it would have been politically easier to give up Taiwan to China, uh, but the United States took a more passionate and emotional, emotional driven, we need to pr preserve democracy in the world as a foothold uh, for that uh, ideological stand. So because of that, um, we've held on to Taiwan. Uh, one of the flaws in this argument is it, does, it, it focuses on the 1950s, so it doesn't really have a lot to do with strategic ambiguity, because in the 1950s, our stance on Taiwan was pretty firmly supportive, uh, versus today, it's a little bit more difficult if China decided they were going to invade Taiwan. We don't necessarily know which side we would take. It remains ambiguous to this day. Deterrence and arms race. This is from Dr. Pang Zongki uh, in this book here. This is important because it talks about how strategic ambiguity creates deterrence, deterrence creates stagnation, and then stagnation in turn creates an arms race. So basically the way this works is uh, Taiwan requests arms from the United States. The United States gives Taiwan arms. China feels threatened that Taiwan now has more arms than them, so then they build up their military, they buy more arms, and then Taiwan in turn feels threatened again. And both sides build arms, and it creates a leveling tension that continues to grow that could reach a breaking point that would cause an incredibly costly war. So because of this, uh, strategic ambiguity can be viewed as something that creates a stagnation that can be really um, devastating because it doesn't uh, focus on the central problem that is China and Taiwan cooperation. It just kind of kicks the can further along uh, and, and in turn creates very, very high tension. So we'll get into the main argument that I propose in this paper. I call it the tension and ambiguity argument. Uh, essentially, uh, ambiguity in terms of 1976 when it was created uh, with the Taiwan Relations Act uh, was essentially to prevent a war. So in terms of that, the uh, strategic ambiguity has been very successful because there obviously hasn't been a war between China and Taiwan. However, uh, a war could still happen in the future. We don't know about that. So I'm trying to evaluate strategic ambiguity in terms of tension, uh, whether tension has been rising and whether that tension could reach a breaking point that could create a war. I, th I, I view that as a little bit more important. So in terms of tension, we'll be looking at 1979 to the 1990s. I, I, this is my dependent variable. I see this as a successful use of strategic ambiguity because tensions are low. And then we get into the two time periods post-1996, which is the third Taiwan Strait crisis. I'll mention that in a bit. Uh, I see this as an unsuccessful use of strategic ambiguity. That is my independent variable. So I'll be examining uh, the levels of tension 
1996 to 2013, and then 2013 to present. And I define tension in three aspects, which is military testing, military spending, and then government communication and cooperation between Taiwan and China. So we'll use those three factors to determine the relationship between the two in tension. So we start with our dependent variable, 1979 to 1995. Military spending from 85 to 91, you can see that China increases by 60% and Taiwan increases by 34%. That's a pretty large margin of increase in military spending. However, you have to take into consideration that there was a, there was a, a large economic growth in that region. Uh, example seen in Japan, South Korea, and Indonesia. They were overall increasing their economic uh, growth and it's healthy for a country's economic growth to coincide with their military growth. That's just a, a natural repercussion. So it wasn't necessarily tension-based as much as it was an economic growth-based. For military testing, uh, there was only one really significant uh, example of military testing that I found, which was in 1980, which is when China uh, was doing ballistic missile testing in the South Pacific. Uh, it got some backlash from the United States and Taiwan, obviously, but it didn't solidify into anything serious, uh, not like it would today. And then government communication, there was kind of a global, cult uh, like a cultural trend going on in China that was called mainland fever. Uh, where essentially a lot of Taiwanese people started to try to open up to China, and China in turn was uh, fostering a more positive environment to uh, open up to Taiwan. Uh, in January 1st of 1979, they, they created a message to compatriots in Taiwan, which was a message that was sent to civilians in Taiwan um, that was very poetic, and it uh, basically talked about a cultural unification rather than a political unification, and how uh, they are all one Chinese people, uh, ethnically and culturally, and so um, that was kind of the biggest example that people see um, when they point to uh, uh, peaceful cooperation between China and Taiwan. So things were relatively easing at this time. Um, there was open trade. Things were going relatively well, all things considered. Now we get into 1995 to 2013. So in 96, there's the third Taiwan Strait crisis. Basically, in this situation, there's a tension break between uh, China and Taiwan. Uh, China sends... Uh, Navy ships into the Taiwan Strait. The United States in turn brings their ships into the Taiwan Strait. China backs down and China is very humiliated by this incident. So because China is humiliated, they decided they're going to build up their military spending again. 2005, $30 billion budget, 12.6% increase. That's pretty big. And you can see from this table that they've been modernizing their military significantly as well, particularly on the Navy aspect. So as China's been modernizing, they've, they've had to test their new equipment. And that's where you see more tension on the military testing aspect of things. Um, a result of this is the United States actually started uh, using U.S. Marines to train Taiwanese soldiers for a potential invasion starting in 2008. I believe this information was leaked last year, and the Chinese government was not happy about it. Uh, and then government communication and cooperation. Uh, 1996, Taiwan had its first democratically elected presidential election. Uh, this is dangerous for China because they're an authoritarian state. Uh, democracies can be a little bit unstable uh, in this aspect with a free thought and free speech during this. Uh, parties like the DPP, Democratic Progressive Party of 2008, uh, they start to push things like a pro-independence movement. And even if it's not going to happen, just that discussion on the floor makes China very paranoid and tensions rise as a result of this. 2013 to present, what we start to see, military spending. Uh, China has numerically the largest navy in the world right now. That's just number of boats, that's not necessarily power, but numerically they have the largest navy. By 2030, they're projected to have 549 ships, while the United States currently has 283. So because of this, it's clear that the China is going to continue to increase their military spending and they're, in they're increasing their military budget uh, to have that naval power and the ability that they could invade Taiwan if they needed to. 2021, uh, I don't know if some of you may have heard about this. There was 149 Chinese aircraft that deployed, that's supposed to say Southwest Taiwan. That was a mistake. Uh, Southwest Taiwan, it caused a massive scramble. A lot of um, military people in Taiwan thought that they were being invaded, and it caused uh, mass hysteria. So China's been upping their game and doing these military tests on a scale such as this um, to keep Taiwan on their toes and show them that they're capable of invading at any time. Um, again, increasing that tension drastically. And then the cooperation between Taiwan and China is also at an all-time low uh, because of this, the growth of political parties, such as the DPP, which I mentioned before, and then the Kuomintang, uh, the KMT. Um, they, while statistically the majority of uh, Taiwanese people understand that uh, independence means war and illegal independence can't happen right now, Every year it's discussed at political elections. So because the discussion of independence, whether de jure or de facto, whether it's in theory or in practice, 
uh, that's still on the table. And every time it's brought up, China gets very paranoid. So that tension is just continuing to rise and the disagreements are continuing to rise. So the policy implications that come out of this. Uh, strategic ambiguity, as we saw, uh, was largely a success in the 1970s and 80s because it was able to foster a little bit more cooperation with the United States having a more hands-off approach. But since China has grown in strength and since the third Taiwan Strait crisis, things have reached such a breaking point that strategic ambiguity is causing more harm than good because both countries are incredibly paranoid of one another and they're both willing to go to war at any time. So because of this, the policy consideration that I thought would be applicable to the situation, we need to push for cultural reunification while maintaining Taiwan as a politically autonomous state. So as I mentioned before, uh, when strategic ambiguity was successful in the 70s and 80s, uh, they were able to foster a relationship where they could see themselves as one China, but they were politically different. Um, things have not been that cool ever since, in my opinion. Um, so if we can try to push for a more positive outcome from that, where they can see themselves as culturally Chinese, but politically different, um, that would be huge. And then decreasing U.S. arms sale to Taiwan, um, that would allow the United States to remain more neutral um, instead of uh, adding to that tension that I mentioned of that arms race cycle. Pulling the United States out of that might help to ease tensions as well, showing China that they are more neutral than in favor of Taiwan. And then setting concrete boundaries, making the United States like a referee. So basically saying, if you cross this line, then the United States is going to militarily interfere on whichever country is involved. So saying uh, missile testing in this location is too close in Taiwan, the China will be uh, attacked by the United States or vice versa. Um, that, that would allow for um, a peaceful cooperation between the two countries, and that would start to lower that tension uh, that I mentioned before. So my conclusion, uh, strategic ambiguity was overall uh, an initial success. Um, but as we started to see that arms race cycle that started to create as uh, China gained more prominence and more power has done more harm than good. And so strategic ambiguity is more of a focal point of disagreement rather than um, success, successful uh, easing of tension. The United States still maintains an idealistic view of democracy. So we need to make sure that Taiwan remains uh, politically independent. However, we can't allow for any large scale conflict to be a result of this. So in order to do that, we need to push for political autonomy, but cultural reunification. And we need to uh, remove uh, conflict friction points in the Taiwan Strait and create a uh, specific policy that prevents both nations from doing military testing or anything uh, conflict brewing in the Taiwan Strait. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Caleb Riley. Thank you all for letting me come here uh, as a West Pointer and talk to the oldest private military college um, in the United States. It's, it's truly my honor to be here. Uh, briefly, what I'm going to talk today about is the Yugoslavia Civil War and the Allies between 1941 and 1945. As you may or may not know, a civil war raged alongside the conventional war during World War II inside of Yugoslavia. And this resulted in massive violence and destruction within the country of Yugoslavia, resulting in upwards of 1.75 million deaths, which is one of the highest per capita um, casualty rates of any nation during World War II. To talk about this, we're going to look at the background of Yugoslavia briefly, as well as what the beginning of the war looked like. And then we're going to examine the competing factions within Yugoslavia and how the civil war and the misunderstanding of it led to the changing allied support that waxed and waned and evolved throughout the war. Finally, we'll look at the outcome of the war uh, before I conclude. So Yugoslavia was formed following World War I as the kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes. Um, interestingly, those nations Although they had always been under some sort of empirical power, they had never been united under one flag prior to uh, the, the, the Treaty of Versailles established it in 1918-1919. What we saw is that it was established under an, under an organization that was highly favorable towards the ethnic majority, which were the Serbs. The Serbs were riding a, a wave of high esteem following their performance during the Balkans War in 1913, as well as uh, Serb perceived military pro 
uh, preeminence during World War I. This, this uh, establishment of the government that was favorable towards Serbia may have been beneficial to the Serbs in the short run, but in the long, in the long run, and, and especially by the time we got to World War II, it was highly detrimental to the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. During the 1920s and the 1930s, ethnic relations between the majority Serbs and the next highest ethnic minority Croats continually deteriorated. Um, this included leaders of political parties being assassinated on the steps of parliament. It included Croatian political representative refusal to participate within the Yugoslav parliament, which only led to more um, more problems between the Croats and Serbs. And all of this was occurring during the Great Depression. It was occurring while war clouds were on the horizon. Yugoslavia desperately clung to its neutral status, um, but, but they were seeking help from the Allies. Unfortunately for them, uh, the, the British and the French specifically were in no position to offer ex extra support to Yugoslavia. Germany, on the other hand, had great strategic interests down in the Balkans regions, especially the oil fields of Romania, the minerals within Yugoslavia itself, as well as the, the large workforce potential that was located within Yugoslavia. In 1939 and late 1940, Germany made some strong pushes to um, gain Yugoslav, to, to force Yugoslavia to join the tripartite pact, but the Yugoslav region continually demurred. However, that changed on 25 March 1941. Yugoslavia assented to the tripartite pact, um, but they actually secured some pretty important provisos in there for themselves, including uh, no need for them to provide soldiers to support the Axis war machine, no need to allow Germany to station their troops inside Yugoslavia, although that's questionable. And then it also had some post-war guarantees on behalf of the Axis for Yugoslavia. However, the previous 20 years of discontentment finally boiled over two days later. And on 27 March, there was a, a coup that rapidly overthrew the government. When Hitler heard of this coup, he was thrown into a rage and he immediately said, we will crush Yugoslavia, and the exact quote is, with merciless brutality. Um, and that they did. On 6 April, the Axis invaded Yugoslavia, and a mere 12 days later, Yugoslavia was completely under Axis control. This is, this is truly a fascinating military accomplishment, but the reason that they were so successful, part, partly, is because um, they negotiated a separate peace with the independent nation of Croatia. And the independent nation of Croatia um, is, was led by an individual named Anti Pavlic. And Anti Pavlic was actually a member of a, of a terribly brutal fascist party called the Ustaja. And the Ustaja promised to be able to control Croatia and provide a good level of security, which is exactly what Hitler needed at that point in time. As you may or may not know, Operation Barbarossa was supposed to start on 12 May, which is just a mere month later. So he needed to make sure that his southern flank was secured, that he had access unfettered to those oil fields in the Balkans, um, and that Yugoslavia was not a problem. Unfortunately for him, by placing the Ustasia in charge, they were actually not widely regarded by the Croats themselves. So the leaders of the independent nation of Croatia were actually ill-prepared to govern um, a, a state that did not actually want them in charge. Germany, for its part, in the areas that it did personally control, um, used the same brutal tactics, their same brutal occupation tactics that they had throughout Europe. And for every German soldier that was wounded, 50 Yugoslav civilians would be killed. And for every Yugoslav, excuse me, for every German soldier that was killed, 100 Yugoslav citizens would be killed. And this played a major role in how these competing factions ended up using the um, Axis for their own advantage. So if we look at the Ustasia, which I've briefly touched on, it was led by Anti Pavlic. They were ardently Croat. They were a fascist organization. And they relied heavily on Catholicism. Um, they they, they co-opted 
Catholic priests to help them with their mission. The Ustasia ruled brutally. They have the unfortunate misnomer of being the only individuals outside of Germany's sphere to, to enact their own concentration camp. And at the Yasinovic concentration camp, upwards of 400,000 Serbs and Jews were brutally murdered by the Ustasia. If we look at the other two competing factions within the Yugoslav civil war, we have the Chetniks and the Partisans. The Chetniks were actually not one main group of organized resistance, and that led to a lot of the missteps and miscues by the Allies over, um, over the course of the war. But the main Chetnik band that was recognized by the Allies was led by an individual named Draja Mihailovic. Mihailovic was not actually um, some sort of guerrilla warfare genius. In fact, he was a, a moderately performing staff officer at outset of the war, and he just refused to, to give in. Um, but being that he was loyal to the monarch that was at this time in exile in London, and that he was willing to carry the flag, so to speak, within Yugoslavia, uh, the Allies initially put all of their support behind him. And finally, the, the last competing faction within Yugoslavia was called the Partisans. It was the National Army of Liberation, and they were led by a, a little-known communist named Josip Broz Tito. Um, and Tito was ardently communist. However, at the behest of the Soviet Union, um, they did not emphasize their communism so much as they did their pan-Yugoslavism. So, in other words, their nationalism and their pride in being Yugoslavian, vice being Croatian or Montenegrin or Serbian or Orthodox or Catholic, um, they just emphasized that they needed to be a national unit that resisted the Axis invaders. The problem is, as you can tell from my very clear chart, is that it's confusing. And this is on paper. So imagine if you are on the ground and you are trying to decide who is friend or foe, and if you are not even speaking your own native language, and they themselves are speaking a mixture of different languages. It's very difficult to figure out who to support. Um, and the other problem is that the moniker Chetnik was used to describe Croatian Ustasia who believed that they were performing the work of um, the, the, the greatness of the Balkan nations. It was also used by Draja Mihailovic's folks. The term partisan, as you probably know, is, is often just applied to any guerrilla band. So whenever you read Axis reports of guerrilla activity, they often mention the partisans. Well, you don't know if they were talking about Tito's partisans or if they were talking about the Chetniks um, because they simply use the term partisan. So when the Allies tried to figure out who they were going to support, they, they waxed and waned and frankly got it right, and sometimes they got it wrong. Um, and this, this really fueled the Civil War. As you can imagine, guns and ammo and food and medical supplies were hard to come by within Yugoslavia. And initially supporting Draja Mihailovic in 1941 and 1942, Mihailovic didn't really want to conduct very many kinetic operations, and this was actually in line with Allied policy. Um, and the reason it was in line with Allied policy is because they had their hands full in North Africa, um, and and they were in no position to provide real, really any large support. So Mihailovic took a step back because he didn't want to suffer the consequences by the hands of the Germans. On the other hand, the partisans, who also weren't really receiving any Allied support at this time, used the German reprisals as a recruiting method. They said, if you're with us, we will protect you. We will take it to the fight of these evil Germans. If you are against us, we will also crush you as we crush the Germans. The problem is, is that Churchill was a very pragmatic individual. And when he was asked, how, how are you going to support this communist band? He said, first off, he said that, well, I'm not going to be governed by them following the war. So it shows a very pragmatic, um, he, whoever's killing Germans was, was his friend. And that was ultimately what led the, the big shift in 1943 to, to move Allied support from, from primarily being the Chetniks to being primarily behind the partisans. We still saw a confused policy, though, because there was a lot of politics and distrust between the US and the UK, both supporting 
uh, various factions within Yugoslavia. And ultimately what we end up seeing is that a lot of the guns that were provided by the British or the Americans were used respectively by the partisans and by the Chetniks not to fight the Germans or the Italians, but instead to fight each other. And so this brutal civil war was waged and it was fueled by Allied guns and war material. There were some really compelling missions that took place that used the support of both the um, Chetniks and the partisans, most notably Operation Halyard. So between August and December of 1944, um, Operation Halyard rescued about 800 Allied airmen who had been downed throughout Yugoslavia. Um, this is really an incredible story because they rescued all of those people, 12, 12 people at a time per plane load. So 800 divided by 12, publicly educated in Alaska. I'm not going to do the math up here. It was a lot of airplanes in single runs. The Soviets didn't ever actually really support the partisans as much as you would expect until they showed up in October of 1944. And then it was really in a paternalistic manner. Um, and this, this set, <coughs> excuse me, this set Tito off. As you can see in this quote, Tito was going to be no one's little brother. Tito viewed himself as the leader of a great power nation and did not think that he owed the Soviets anything. And in fact, he wanted a seat at the table as equals. So as we look at, um, if, if you've been here throughout the conference today, one of, the, one of the goals of Russia for eons has been to establish buffer states of friendly organizations. Tito, although he was communist, wasn't exactly friendly towards the Soviets. Um, and that actually led eventually to the split in 1948. And this split is remarkable because Tito then led what was called the non-aligned movement for the next for, for the remainder of his life, which was <coughs> an organization of um, communist nations, third world communist nations, that he encouraged to not bow to Russian pressure. It, it's really a fascinating thing. War continued in, in Yugoslavia, though, seven days after Europe, after it ended in the rest of Europe. Draza Mihailovic was uh, tried in June of 1946. I'm sure it was a fair trial, after which he was he was immediately shot, <coughs> and Anti Pavlich fled to Argentina, uh, where he was shot in 1957, and he died a slow and painful death two years later. Finally, I'm, as I sum it up, I, I love this picture of Stepan Filipovich um, because it's it's so powerful. It shows you the emotion uh, behind a civil war. So Filipovich was a partisan leader who was captured in 1942. And as he's here about to be hung, his final words were death to fascism, freedom to the people. And if you look really close at the picture, you see that he's being hung not by Germans or Italians, but he's being hung by um, Ustasia militants. He's being hung by his own people. Um, and that truly is, is the travesty of the Yugoslavia Civil War during World War II. So thank you for your time today. That concludes my brief. How y'all doing? My name is John Walsh. Uh, I'm here to present about my paper, A Continuation of a Dictatorship, How U.S. Policy and Practice Led to the Continuation of Saddam's Regime in the Eyes of the Iraqi People. So before we start, I want to go over some key terms that I believe are necessary to understand. Uh, from Our first two terms come from MCRP 05 TAC 12 Alpha operational terms and graphics. So that is what the US military officially, how the US military officially defines these terms. Control, a tactical mission task that requires the commander to maintain physical influence over a specified area to prevent its use by an enemy. Occupy, a tactical mission task that involves a force moving into an area so that it can control the entire area both the forces movement to the occupation of the area occur without enemy opposition. And finally, insurgency. An insurgency is an uprising, organized uprising that uses violent and nonviolent means to overthrow an existing government or to wrest away control, either de jure or de facto, over part of their territory. When I say insurgency, I do not mean terrorist. <laughs> 
Okay? There are very two very different things. And if you'd like to talk about that, I'll talk about that during question and answer period. So, my key text and thesis. In my paper, I primarily use literature, specifically theater, from Iraq. I use the plays Ishtar in Baghdad by Rasha Fadhil, A Strange Bird on a Roof, published in Contemporary Plays from Iraq by Amir al-Azraqi, and finally the book Night Draws Near Anthony Sh by Anthony Shadid. These works demonstrate how the occupation of Iraq by the U.S. in 2003 was not an end to Saddam's regime, but rather a desperate attempt by the U.S. government to build back up a broken nation that instead led to a continuation of the dictatorship. So before we talk about how this affected the nation, I want to talk about each text in specific. So Ishtar in Baghdad. I want a quick poll. Who here has heard of the Abu Ghraib prison scandal? Raise your hands. Okay, that's more than I thought, and I'm glad to see. So for those who haven't, the Abu Ghraib prison scandal. Abu Ghraib prison is a prison in Abu Ghraib, about 30 miles from Baghdad. It was originally Saddam Hussein's prison that he used for his political prisoners. After we took the, pris the prison, we started using it ourselves, the U.S. In the prison, United States Army and members of the CIA committed many documented human rights violations and war crimes against detainees in Abu Ghraib including physical, mental, and sexual abuse. We can see some pictures that I have up there. There's many more on the internet if you want to do your own research. As a result, the United States Department of Defense removed 17 soldiers and officers from duty. 11 soldiers were prosecuted with dereliction of duty, mal maltreatment, aggravated assault, and battery. The people in this prison were not just insurgents, as we say. They were also common criminals. There were those who did commit crimes against the occupational U.S., and then just normal people who got caught up in this, unfortunately. The play Ishtar in Bagh Baghdad by Rasha Fadhil uses fictional characters, Ishtar and Tammuz, who are two Mesopotamian gods to tell a very real story of the events of Abu, of Abu Ghraib. They are first detained in Iraq when coming down to visit the world, and then they are brought to Abu Ghraib where they experience many of the scandals that happened in the prison, in particular the two I have up there right now. It discusses the atrocities committed by the U.S. military. Now here we can see where Iraq culture and U.S. culture kind of clash. So, in Iraq culture, way back when, when we, first took, when we first took Baghdad, we were using the rules, Abu Bakr's rules of warfare. Abu Bakr was the first caliph, which is the first leader of the Muslim people, directly following Muhammad. I'm not talking about the famous ISIS terrorist. And his rules of warfare include, do not commit treachery or deviate from the right path. You must not mutilate dead bodies and do not kill children, nor women, or aged men. All of these happened in the Abu Ghraib prison scandal. Rasha Fadhil says that she believes this play has not been produced in Iraq because of the fact the Iraqi people do not want to admit to the shame and that this incident brought upon their culture. It also talks specifically about the plight of Iraqi women in the prison, which she said is not talked about at all in the country. The play ends with an insurgent rocket attack on the prison, which is a real event that killed many prisoners, including, in the story, Ishtar and Tammuz. We can really see some cultural clash throughout the play with certain quotes. In particular, Ishtar says when she is first detained and she's being tortured, I know this land, the history of every grain of sand is in my blood, she states. I almost hear its sands boiling with hatred and desire for revenge on you. Now, Ishtar in culture is a, is a figure representing a very high quality of love and peace. Ishtar in this story is meant to be a metaphor for the Iraqi people who were caught up in this invasion, and unfortunately, many lost their lives. 
The next text I use is Night Draws Near. Night Draws Near is a, first -hand, is a collection of first-hand accounts and interviews from Iraqi civilians compiled by Anthony Shadid while he was in Iraq during the invasion. It focuses on the before, after, and during the invasion and also talks greatly about the rise of insurgency we see throughout the region. The final text I use is A Strange Bird on Our Roof. I was not able to find the author of the play. However, it was produced in Anthony, uh, no, sorry, as you were, Amir El-Azraqi's book, A Contemporary Prelays from Iraq. The Strange Bird on a Roof follows a true story according to Anthony Shadid, who I got the chance to interview, about a family who had, who, whose house was invaded by the U.S. military. In itself, it's a whole metaphor for the war. The place starts with the U.S. military coming in force, taking the house, and then eventually leaving behind one soldier to watch over the place. And quickly we see distrust established with the mother and the daughter who live in the house, their son, who is a terrorist, well, no, sorry, insurgent, who is off, who is not in the house. The play goes to great lengths to show the cultural distance and distrust with the mother and daughter. In Iraqi culture, bird keepers are often kept, are often considered to be thieves as the bird cage is on the roof of the house. Throughout the play, they make references to the fact that the soldier is on top of the house in the position of the bird keeper. There are birds in cages on the house. It's supposed to allude to the fact that the people in the story consider him to be a thief. Eventually, after much time, trust starts to develop between the Iraqi family and the, and the individual soldier, which is a good point of how Iraqis did not hate Americans while the U.S. was invading. Re in reality, they just hated the practice and the policy the U.S. government was using. They did not hate individuals. And finally, the play ends with the American receiving word that the building that he is occupying is about to be attacked by the insurgents and evacuating himself and the family and unfortunately, the family gets left in a much in a poor financial state, living in a tent on U.S. on U.S. controlled area, much how like we left the nation after after the end of uh, at the after the end of Operation Iraqi Freedom. So the long-term effects of the invasion. Obviously, we see a breakdown of trust between America and the people of Iraq and a mistrust of the U.S. across the entire Mideast. This, this figure is from um, the, uh, the Arab Center in Washington, D.C. In addition, we see a large amount of foreign influence come into the country of Iraq, particularly from Iran. We see this is where the start of Iranian militias who currently reside in Iraq, this is the start of it. Iraq's politics, according to Amir al-Azraqi, are, in, are riddled with foreign influence from Iran. And I got the, also had the opportunity to talk to a Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, Sanal, as you were, a Sergeant Major of Marines, very different, who was a battalion Sergeant Major for three different battalions throughout the operation. He had three, tour, three tours of duty. Uh, two was with the infantry, infantry battalions, and then one was with combat engineers. He said that you could tell the difference of between people you fight. There's a difference between how an Iraqi would fight who picked up a rifle about a month ago to fight back for himself, for, for his home, versus how a freedom fighter from Russia or Iran have been fighting their entire lives. It's noticeable. So at the end of the day, why does this all matter? Well, the answer is pretty simple, honestly. Even though this ended in 2011 officially, First of all, we still see great influence that these foreign, fa foreign influences have in Iraq. And also, this is a lesson about invasions and how we conduct them in the future. David John Q. Cohen is a member of the U.S. State Department who kind of wrote the book on counterinsurgency. David Q. Cohen believed that returning the nation to a state of normalcy and order was more important than killing every insurgent in in the region to end the violence. At the end of the day, killing people is not going to, is not gonna make a nation better. At the end of the day, we gotta rebuild a nation that we destroy if we really wanna improve it. 
The U.S. needs to understand the culture of the nation that we invade and occupy. Or better yet, just don't get involved. There are some nations that we have sought conflict with that at the end of the day, Iraq included, we've definitely put them in a worse situation. As soon as you use terms like liberation and winning the hearts and minds of a population in a military operation where you intend to destroy the country's infrastructure, you've already failed. You cannot win the hearts and minds of a population whose home you've just destroyed, as we currently see in Ukraine with Russia and their invasion. And Putin spouting these ideas of liberation and freeing them from the neo-Nazi government that he says in his speech exists, we see this uprising of people in Ukraine fighting back, much like how we saw in Iraq. You will never, you will never end an insurgency just by fighting. These people will never give in. And, more, and the more insurgents you kill, the more you will create. That is it, all I have. Thank you all for your time. Good, after this one. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Can you all hear me okay? okay. All right, I'll thank you all for being out here today and listening to our uh, papers and the commentary. I'd like to keep this uh, brief as possible, but uh, these papers gave me a lot of food for thought because even though they're on topics that are not directly related to uh, the what's going on just a few thousand miles away, I felt that they actually have a lot to offer in terms of um, connections. So I'll start with um, John Walsh's paper, Ethan Owens, and then Caleb Riley. So um, I think John's paper asks us to really remember and reconsider and reflect on um, US violence um, and the terrible results that um, poor understanding of a different culture wrought um, on the lives of everyone who was involved, but really very critically for the people of the, of the countries, uh, Iraq and then later Afga Afghanistan and then later Iraq. Um, and I think um, it's sort of something for maybe John to consider or in, in think about um, is, um, you know, I think one question that in a previous ch uh, panel, uh, Dr. Chadley's, I think, brought up, is there room for nation building in US foreign policy? And perhaps uh, recent examples show that no, there shouldn't be, right? Um, and so uh, I think in um, your thinking, um, is there still room for nation building of some kind? Or is this an option that should be taken off, right? Because um, the recent examples have uh, they've been the result or failed results from you know, violence and invasion. Um, Ethan Owens? Ethan's papers um, is a really interesting, I think, uh, because I study modern Chinese history, uh, looking at a very present but ongoing kind of um, issue, right, that involves uh, three distinct and autonomous um, political entities, the US, China, and Taiwan. Of course, everyone else in the region is very closely monitoring this uh, even now. And I think this uh, you know, topic of strategic ambiguity thing that you bring up is really interesting because it's something that frustrates our allies as much as maybe they frustrate our adversaries. Um, and in uh, the themes of some of the panels today, and I think of course tomorrow, uh, we seem to be in, in this present moment, in this room right now, we seem to be living in a moment where um, some long held conceptions, long held assumptions about the international rules, rules of order, seems to be really sort of shifting underneath us, right? It's really scary and, 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 what, have, and what have you. So um, in such a, a situation, uh, having people play a game where no one knows the rules seems to be quite unfortunate and, and dangerous, right? So I was wondering what your, your thoughts about that uh, might be. Um, and then this sort of you know, question about culturally acknowledging you know, sort of connections, but politically being separate. Well, I think you know, we can argue that politics is culture, right? It is the way that people engage with and think about power and how to sort of run their lives. And there's a cultural component to that, right? The, the act of voting, the act of 
challenging your representative or what have you. So um, when we, so so I, I think I'm sort of interested in your definition of culture and what you think about that. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, Caleb Riley's paper is a really thoughtful look at a very confusing episode, right, of the mid uh, 20th century uh, that unfortunately has a lot of bodies in its wake. But I, I found it really interesting that you know Yugoslavia or the former Yugoslavia is a case where it didn't work out, where people who lived in an area that was very multi-ethnic, multi-religious, uh, multilinguistic, uh, weren't able to kind of keep it together for various reasons as you um, laid out in your paper. So uh, as we look at what's going on in Ukraine, and I think Dr. Pisano in the earlier um, panel mentioned that the Ukrainian um, leadership right now seems to be pretty successful in shifting the needle um, in trying to identify national identity as something uh, based on diversity, more civic, rather than on these sort of older ethnic religious ties. Uh, from what you've learned about sort of the mid 20th century, what you know about these countries and the, the way things turned out, uh, what do you think um, the view is from the other side, where, where it didn't stay together? And does Ukraine and its present moment offer something of an alternative? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? So those are my comments, and I look forward to um, hearing um, everything from the panel and questions and, and what have you. And I'll turn it over to Professor Thunberg. All right, thanks everybody. So first and foremost, these were awesome papers to read. Uh, so it's really good to see that you all are thinking about these things and taking a more scholarly look into these uh, into these different topics. I was really impressed with the quality of work from, from you all um, at this level. So first and foremost, really impressed uh, by what you all came up with. So I'll go over kind of my comments and then hopefully we'll get some good discussion going from the audience. So I'll start with the Owens piece. Um, and I think that the first the first comment that I have is that one of the concerns is that you kind of take a monolithic look of each of these countries. So, right, it's the U.S., it's China, and it's Taiwan. And, and yes, there's a lot of uh, approaches in international relations that allow us to look at states as unitary actors, but I think the, the Riley paper showed us there's a lot going on within the states, right? So there's a lot that I think you can look beyond just kind of these individual unilateral actors uh, to kind of give yourself a little bit more, uh, a little bit more leverage. One of the things that I questioned in thinking of that is how you pick the documents that you were looking at, right? So you said that there were some correspondence that you looked at and then this Taiwanese act. And that might be the official kind of US statement and approach, but at the same time, you know, I, I can see the official approach and then the way that the State Department defines it and the way that the State, uh, the Defense Department defines it, that all of them are gonna be a little bit different and that can add to the complexity of the ambiguity uh, that, you might, that you might be thinking about. So you can look into some different uh, documents, uh, some different documents as well. On that point, you, you also kind of want to look at the flip side, so not just the way that the U.S. is defining these things, but how is Taiwan receiving this kind of strategic ambiguity, and how does that shape their actions um, in, some, in some different ways? Um, you have a really good definition, given that though, you still have a really good definition of strategic ambiguity. I think one thing that I would like to see is a little bit better definition of tension. Um, so, you know, does increased military spending necessarily equal tension? Uh, there's a lot of different types of tension that are out there, uh, and I think that that could be defined a little bit better. Uh, as you kind of go through these case studies, you also say that China's tension is increasing and therefore its military spending is really increasing. Well, you know, in this kind of realist world, there's a lot of threats out there. So China's military spending might be increasing for things completely unrelated to Taiwan, right? And there's a lot of challenges. And especially on the world stage, a stronger military, a stronger force gives powers a bigger voice. And China wants to have a bigger voice on the world stage. So they might just be bolstering up their military for completely unrelated reasons to Taiwan. And that's something that can be really difficult to entangle, but something uh, to disentangle, but something to, to potentially think, think about. One of the last things that you said in your policy implications talked about kind of a U.S. red line, right? So if, if uh, China or Taiwan crosses this red line, the U.S. is going to get involved. Um, and I would challenge you to maybe think about that because lines by their nature are tested, right? And, and China will want to test that line. Uh, and that can, that can raise credibility issues for the United States. 
Um, but on that point, at what point does strategic ambiguity really start to fail and the United States does have to step in and we do have to say, okay, we're gonna do something. What does that look like and when does that happen? And is kind of a red line the way that we wanna go or are there some different, uh, are there some different approaches? Um, on the Riley piece, uh, so in, in the sense that, that Owens can take kind of a lesson from the Riley piece and look deeper into the, into the state, I think that the Riley piece can, can kind of generalize a little bit more. So in reading the paper, you do a really excellent job in kind of developing this timeline and this narrative and you introduce the characters and you introduce the complexities of it, but I think that it needs to be broadened and you need to step outside of Yugoslavia a little bit to try to give us some broader generalizations. Um, so really good details of, of events and actors, uh, but what does this tell us a little bit more broadly about things like eth ethnic, conflict, uh, ethnic conflict? Um, how can we apply this to other international cases, right? Are there other case studies that we could apply this to? There's a lot of different um, ethnic conflicts going, in, going on within Afghanistan right now. How can we apply this to that? Um, how, can we, how can we look at kind of spillover effects from major conflicts into some of these kind of secondary or, or tertiary areas and how that might have an impact? Um, and how do we determine when outside actors are actually getting involved, right? So you gave an example of how different outside actors ended up getting involved in this, but trying to generalize and understand what's drawing them in in a broader picture, I think could be really beneficial. Um, so I think kind of taking a, taking a step back and, and kind of looking at the bigger picture would really help uh, ground your paper a little bit more. Uh, the, Walsh, uh, the Walsh paper I really thought was super interesting, right? So you're, you're looking at the, the role of, uh, of art and understanding one of the worst things in humanity, right? Of conflict and war. And I, I would encourage you as you continue to develop this paper to think about how the, the humanity of these individuals is reflected in the art that they're producing when it's a group of people that can't can't do anything else, right? They, they don't have any other outlet, so they're kind of leaning on this idea of art and the impact of art, and I think that that's really valuable in a lot of ways and something that you can develop more. Um, as I started to read the paper, and even as you were kind of going through it in the, in the presentation, one thing that I, uh, I think you can work on is how you approach this, this art, right? So I think there's two ways you can do it. One is you can look at the real world events uh, that are happening in Iraq, and then you can say, all right, well, here's how it's been portrayed in art by these individuals on the ground, right? Um, and another way that you could potentially do it is really flesh out what these different artistic pieces are, who are the characters, what are the events, and then relate it back to the, to the real world events. All right, but either way, I think you want to make sure that you're really focusing on the art and kind of uh, building, up, uh, building up that conversation. You're focusing on, on things that were created by the Iraqi people. Uh, and one of the things you said in your presentation was that there's this US-Iraq culture clash. It would also be really interesting to compare how US folks have covered these things, right? Because I'm guessing it's gonna be fundamentally different. Um, or how Europeans have covered these things and kind of showcase you know, how different cultural approaches have looked at these, um, have looked at these, these very, difficult, uh, very difficult issues. Um, the last thing I would say is you, you mentioned a couple interviews that you, that you did. You should really build that up, right? Talk about the interviews that you're doing. That's a lot of work and that's something that you should, uh, that you should really be focusing on incorporating into your paper um, because that gives a lot of life to the things that you're doing and that gives kind of a primary, uh, a primary connection to the, to the work that you're putting together. Uh, so really good papers, everybody. I really, I really enjoyed reading them uh, and I'll turn it back over to our moderator for some, for some questions. Thank you. Round of applause for our presenters. Uh, at this time, I'd like to invite any members of the audience to come down. We have two microphones down here. You can ask some questions of our panelists here. Um, while you guys think that over, maybe come up with some queries for our student presenters, I think I'll give them an opportunity to maybe weigh in on some of the comments that were made by the discussants. Any thoughts, any reactions, uh, anything like that? Feel free to jump in. So that's a great point about looking at what external factors led to allied an, an influx of Allied support. So between 1941 and 1942, the Allies provided very little support, very little in the way of material support to, to anyone in Yugoslavia. 
And if we think about what, what wartime events were happening in World War II at that time, the Allies were frankly on their heels um, and, and weren't too concerned with what was going on in the Balkans. But at the end of 1942, the British and the, and the Americans had seen some pretty good success in North Africa. They turned around Rommel's army, um, and that allowed them to, to see a broader view. The other, um, the other impetus that led to additional Allied material support into Yugoslavia is their unwillingness to open up a second front already. Um, and so the way that they saw they could do that is by sending guns and war material to Yugoslav uh, partisans, I, I use the term partisans being partisans and the, and the Chetniks, um, to appease Stalin so that he, the, the allies could say, see, we are supporting you without actually having to get skin in the game. Any other comments from panelists or shall we open it up to questions? Okay. Uh, I believe this gentleman over here was first. Uh, please uh, identify yourself and offer your query. Hello. You All right. Uh, my name is August Guerreri, and uh, I wanted to go off of Walsh paper, Walsh's paper. Uh, given that our topic discussions today, they covered a lot of how uh, nation building and the spreading of democracy shouldn't be part of U.S. foreign policy. I wanted to ask, is it realistic that this, that uh, nation building will ever not be part of U.S. foreign policy, considering the influence of politicians such as uh, John McCain, John Kerry, the Bush and Clinton families, uh, Dick Cheney, and others who may have economic interest in keeping the military industrial complex afloat? Thank you. So I think, from what I know, I think it's unrealistic to say that the U.S. will reach a point where we are not involved in nation building of other countries just because of the amount we have meddled in other nations as it is already. And we've kind of established this role as the protector of democracy across the world, which I think is an unrealistic goal of the U.S. in general. Uh, the, I guess the second part to that answer would be should we? be involved in nation building and spreading democracy, my answer to that is really no. Um, I think we, when we spread democracy, in general, we use the military. And as I spoke about greatly, when you destroy someone's home, they're not going to want to hear what you're going to say. So I think that, that did I get to your, your uh, question there? Yeah, I, mean, I just wasn't here if it was realistic to expect that. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes, um, Lyle Goldstein. I'm at, I'm at Brown University and with defense priorities as well. And uh, I, w I just want to really commend a, a fantastic panel. I mean, I learned something from all the papers and all the comments as well. And, and uh, so congrats to all there. Um, and, and I would say, you know, I think we have to reflect how great a university is in our, in our country too, where we you know, are so honest about our own uh, mistakes and we don't just sort of pass on to the next crisis, but we actually sit and think very hard about the meaning of this. After all, we, we did that. We were responsible for that. Um, but I would like to, as a mostly China specialist, let me address uh, strategic ambiguity because it, it's critically important. After all, the economists last year, I think, rightly said that Taiwan Strait is the most dangerous place in the world. And I would submit that that is still true even after what we saw in Ukraine. Um, and uh, I think you did an outstanding job dealing with a, such a complicated issue. But I would just uh, uh, let me also add on to the, the good commentary about the paper. You know, I, I'm curious what is, you know, in your mind, what is cultural unif reunification? I mean, that, that's a pretty novel concept. So maybe you can unpack that a little for us. But let me also make a quick comment on the arms sales because you're, you're onto something. And by the way, your recommendation, extremely brave, right? Because the conventional wisdom is, oh, let's just, you know, how about, how about another 20 billion in arms sales and won't that be great? And by the way, a lot of Americans getting fabulously rich off this, so, you know, what's wrong with that? Well, you rightly point out there is something wrong with that because it is fueling a cycle. So what to do? And here I would just say maybe there's a lesson, maybe you have a thought on this, maybe there's a lesson from Ukraine, right? In Ukraine, turns out some, some pretty simple weaponry actually, you know, javelins and stingers, infantry weapons, turn out to be absolutely critical. 
And maybe it's not the uh, fighter aircraft, which many of us who study the issue, honestly, we don't think those will get off the ground because they'll all be destroyed in uh, initial missile strikes. So maybe what the answer is to kind of go to these uh, less high-tech weaponry that don't inflame the situation, and yet we've seen that they can be very effective. So I just throw that out as an idea to reflect on. But, but I commend your, uh, you know, you, you took some brave positions in those conclusions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. That was very flattering. Um, <clears throat> the policy implication part was the biggest thing I struggled with in this paper uh, because I can identify all the problems, I can't identify all the solutions very well. And the cultural reunification is very difficult to put into policy um, because it's it, how do you make a policy about a culture? Um, the biggest draw I got from that was, like I mentioned, uh, you started to see an ease of tension in the 1970s and 80s. And I think that was because there was a larger laissez-faire stance from the United States. There was less influence with the United States. Um, so it, that's why I was thinking my, my policy implication was to try to create that again, where the United States is not so heavily involved in Taiwan and China, and that they can kind of peacefully duke it out themselves without the United States looming over as that sort of uh, nuclear button, I, I guess I would say. Um, thank you very much for the comments. Thank you. Sir. Yeah, as, as soon as that, uh, that war broke out, I was immediately thinking Taiwan, um, because it, it's, it's like a textbook, like, apply this to that sort of thing. And they're two very, very different situations. But it, in terms of U.S. support of an invasion in a complicated situation like that, I think there's strong parallels. Uh, I think it was last week in the news there was a discussion about a, a Chinese whistleblower that had um, leaked information that there was going to be some sort of invasion in the fall and that, that that was uh, pushed back. I don't know how accurate that information is. There's a lot of misinformation with Russia right now. Um, but that, that, that would make sense to me that China, from a Chinese perspective, like we were going to have an invasion and now we're seeing the failures of Russia's invasion. Maybe we want to rethink this. Um, I see China culturally as more of a, a long-term planner with their, with their, deci their decisions. Um, so I, I can assume reasonably that they would look at the issue of Russia and, and think we need to rethink this. Uh, in terms of the United States, I mean, I haven't seen them really. We're still ambiguous as hell. We haven't changed that. But thank you. Okay, I think we got time for the two remaining questions. Yes. Yep. Uh, hello, my name is Qin Xu, and I'm an international student from Taiwan. And uh, I also have some questions about the uh, Taiwan and China issue. And first of all, I want to actually ex express my agreement with you about this, uh, the kind of like this kind of leaning towards strategic, uh, from st strategic ambiguity to a clarity kind of like situation since, you know, from uh, the U.S. perspective, we really want to push the elasticity of Taiwan Relations Act to a more, to, to a more, you know, pro kind of like Taiwan kind of stance, especially when you talk about like last year, American and Taiwan Institute actually confirmed there are some uh, first groups, uh, first special operation group in operating the area. But, uh, you know, but my question for you is how, it's kind of like beating on a dead horse, but how feasible do you think that culture, uh, cultural revolution, no, sorry, cultural reunification is to the both party, especially when Professor Kim actually talked about politics is really tied to the culture. And since both, both sides like, you know, a communist and de democratic uh, stance, so I think that's my question about uh, cultural reun uh, reunification. Thank you. I guess part of my answer to that is um, it's getting harder as time goes on um, because there's generations of, of 
people that are born in, in Taiwan and they see themselves more as Taiwan than Chinese. Um, and I don't think that the cultures necessarily need to see themselves as Chinese, um, but you've, you've got language and cultural similarities that um, government should not inhibit. And I think um, that, that, like I mentioned, that had started to happen um, and then we got all up in the politics issue and it crushed it. And I think I do blame China for that. I'm a little biased, but um, I don't know <laughs> how policy is going to work with that. I'm still wrestling with that. Um, I'm still trying to find a good way to put it into words about how something like that could be fostered. Um, and when you get into legal jargon, it's difficult to impose things like that on sovereign nations. Um, and then the obvious complexity of considering Taiwan a sovereign nation or not. It gets very sticky. Um, but I, I agree, and I think that the cultural issue is the most important, and it's also the most difficult, and it gets harder every day. I think Professor Kim had something to add. It, right. Just to add on to that, you know, from the perspective of Russia or China, why is Ukraine or Taiwan important, right? Or why are they dangerous? I think you know your you know idea about culture. It's because Ukraine's not a place, right? It's an idea. Taiwan's not really a place. It's an idea of what Chineseness could be or Russianness could be, and that alternative is dangerous, right? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, yes. Last question. My name is Max Weber. I am a high school junior at St. Johnsbury Academy. And as you accurately pointed out, the war in Iraq was a fairly major failure in terms of democratizing and uh, liber liberating and uh, a, a people oppressed by a dictator. I have noticed that as of recently, the United States has become much more hesitant when it comes to where it's using military force in order to protect and secure democracy abroad. Um, let's take the withdrawal from Afghanistan as an example. And my question to you would be, where is that red line that you talked about where the United States would consider the use of active military force in the defense of Taiwan? Are you asking me or him? Me? OK, because he's the one who talked about the red line, so I was a bit confused. But uh, so first of all, uh, one thing I didn't say that I really think is true, and people are going to disagree with me, but I think the uh, war on terror in general, is the greatest military failure the U.S. has ever had. And I think that we see this decrease in trying to send military places, trying to influence other countries with these ideas of democracy because of that failure. I don't, I personally don't believe there is a line where we should be using military might to influence a nation towards democracy. I, I think that the idea of that is ludicrous, if I'm to use a strong word, because I think, again, like I've spoken about, if we invade a nation and we destroy it with military might, people aren't going to be all for democracy. They're going to seek something else. Or maybe if they do seek democracy, it's not going to be with us. And I think we're just plowing, we're pushing money into these conflicts that uh, at the end of the day aren't going to bear fruit for us. So I hope I answered your question there. Okay. You were very specific. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Max. And thanks to all of you. Uh, I, it's my pleasure to really wrap up our first day of events at the Peace and War Summit. I want to thank you for all being here. I want to thank you for the tremendous support from the audiences from Norwich University once again. But uh, the best way to end would be to thank our panelists one more time, please. <laughs> <laughs>